For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Uh, what a well-known and often quoted scripture that is, and what a great rendition of it the uh, choir just sang for us. Really, really beautiful. Um, yesterday, someone asked me uh, what passage I was going to be preaching on this morning, and I told them it was John 3.16 and thereabouts, and their response was, oh, well, John 3.16, everyone knows that. That's going to be really easy. And actually, I think... I think it's the complete opposite, if I'm honest with you. I think when you have to preach on something that everyone's heard a thousand times before, it actually becomes a lot more difficult to have anything new and interesting to say about it. Um, but today I'm going to do my best to walk us through the text, and by God's grace I'll help us uh, dig a little bit deeper into this well-known passage. So you might want to have the scripture on hand. Uh, we're going to be referring to it quite a lot, so have your Bibles uh, next to you and have them turned to John chapter 3. As you've probably guessed from the, uh, the, the sermon title, we're going to be talking a lot about God's love. Um, primarily, this, this message, this passage, is about God's love, right? So we're so used to saying that God loves us. But I want us to ask, what do we really mean by saying that God loves us. And I want to start with making one point which you probably know, but let's just make sure that we really understand this. God doesn't love in the same way that humans love. Okay? God doesn't love in the same way that we love. Think about it. Our love is really fickle. Our love changes all the time. Our love is up and down. It comes and goes. Even with the things that we say that we love the most, uh, our children, our spouses, our pets, uh, whatever it is, we tend to fluctuate between loving something really, really well and then sometimes not so much, depending on how we feel in a particular moment, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, sometimes even your spouse is the total object of your devotion and your obsession. At other times, nobody in the world could irritate you more than they do. And if you don't believe me, ask my wife and she'll, uh, she'll confirm that. Now, by a complete contrast to that, God's love is not fickle. God's love never fluctuates. God's love doesn't change. It actually can't change because God doesn't have varying emotional states. God's emotions don't change depending on how he's feeling in a given moment. And the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, tries to get at that point again and again and again when it keeps referring to God's love as what? Steadfast, right? And I quickly googled steadfast to come up with an apt definition and it said dutifully firm and unwavering right? Non-changing. God's love is non-changing. I think of a verse in particular like uh, Isaiah 56. It says, talking about God's love, for the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love for you shall not depart and my covenant of peace shall not be removed. Get the idea? So steady is God's love that even ancient mountains and hills stand more of a chance of going out of existence. So if you're like me, you might be a little bit confused at this point, and you might think, well, is that really true? I mean, what about the Old Testament? It has all these stories of God suddenly getting angry and sort of changing his mind and moving from compassion to, to fury and all that kind of thing. Actually, in the first uh, lectionary passage of today, which comes from Second Chronicles, which we'll look at in a minute, it does indeed seem like God changes from compassion to anger. So follow me with this passage now on the screen, and we'll listen to the chronicler as he offers this, it's this big sweeping history of Israel. He says, in those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, 
for he had compassion on them in his dwelling place. There's the love, right? But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. This historical summary uh, describes Israel's rebelliousness and the consequent captivity into the hands of the Babylonians. Uh, God's people had continually rejected his love, continually turned their back on his law, and given themselves over to various immoralities and sins, worshipping false gods, not letting the land have its Sabbaths, polluting God's temple, as we saw there, etc., etc. And it says that in his deep love, God sends Israel, these various messengers and prophets, uh, trying to warn Israel, you know, clean up your act. But what do the people do to the messengers and prophets? They laugh at them, they mock them, they reject them. And so it says the anger of the Lord is inflamed and he resolves to hand them over to their enemies to be taken into exile. Yes, it really does sound like God has fallen out of love. But remember what I said, God is not capable of having these passing feelings and emotions like we do. So here's, here's how I suggest we, we understand this instead. We have to read this anger as simply a, a mode or a different aspect of God's love. This is not, in the, in the Chronicles passage, this is not like God losing his cool, right? This is not God clenching his fists and stamping his feet and losing his mind. Instead, this anger is God's passion to set things right. God's anger is his passion to set things right. And if you think about it, any of you who have children, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Think about that, right? Your anger, your, 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 your passion to set things right. I remember growing up, you know, if I punched my brother, I would get sent to my room. If I threw my food across the table, I was made to get up, go around the table and pick it up again. And if I, you know, did something even more dangerous, like ran into the street without looking, I remember my father would get really, really angry at me. See, you have to discipline your kids with drastic measures as a way of loving them. See, love that is pure sentimentality, love that is always affirming, never scolding, that will never... that is that okay okay good glad we noticed that otherwise you wouldn't have heard like over half of the sermon which hopefully that's not a good thing for you so as I was saying right you you have to you have to discipline your children as a way of loving them and if you just have love that is pure sentimentality that's always affirming and never scolding you will never be able to develop maturity and deep spirituality in someone. Sometimes it is necessary, right, to perform this drastic kind of surgery. And so God, in his love, because of his love, he allows Israel to go into exile for 70 years as a kind of cleansing process. Because God knows that in the long run, it's going to be better for them. Does that make sense? So far, so good, right? That's kind of pretty easy to understand, I think. Now, something that uh, the New Testament develops a little bit more, I think, and uh, is a little bit harder for us to grasp, but it's, it's, it's there and it's important, um, is, is this. Uh, for it's, we, we read about this in 1 John chapter 4. He says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is 
love. So we've already said that love is not this passing emotion in God. But love is not even an attribute that God has like it is with us. But God is love in his very being. Try and get your mind around that, right? God is love in his being. God is not a person who then sort of has love added to him afterwards. No, he is love. That's exactly what we mean when we talk about the Trinity, right? It's this idea of three persons, one in nature, in an eternal exchange of love between Father, Son, and Spirit. Is it mind-boggling? Yes. Is it easy to understand? No. But it's true. And so Israel continues to sin, continues to reject God, just like we do, right? Always, always falling back into the same bad habits. And in our gospel passage today, we learn that in order to fix this, God, who is love, takes the most drastic measure of all, and he freely gives his whole self to the world, offering his only son, Jesus Christ. And so at the beginning there, Jesus explains this to Nicodemus. Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Exactly. Now, if you're wondering what Jesus is talking about with this Moses and the serpent in the desert, it's actually a story that comes from Numbers chapter 21. If you remember there, I'll remind you, uh, because of Israel's grumbling and complaining in the wilderness, God ends up sending these poisonous snakes uh, in their midst. And what Moses does is he lifts up a bronze snake on a pole, and anyone who looks at that snake is saved from the, venom, the venomous serpents below. And so Jesus uses that as an analogy and says that anyone who looks upon him when he is lifted up will similarly be saved. And of course, what's he talking about? He's talking about the cross. He's talking about his own crucifixion. In other words, Jesus says, anyone who believes in me, anyone who looks upon the cross for their salvation will receive eternal life. Just a word about eternal life. You know, I think we're so entrenched in thinking that eternal life is just simply about living forever, and that's it. And of course, that's part of it. But God's gift of eternal life, it's not just about duration. It's not just about getting to heaven. It's not just about existing infinitely. No, the gift of eternal life signifies a qualitative difference in the life that you have now. Remember, God's very being is love. And so by sending his son to die on a cross, we get reconnected. We get, as in the Christian language, we get reconciled to God. So believing in Jesus means that we actually get to share in that divine love. It's really, really powerful stuff going on here when you dig a little deeper. And then later, Jesus explains, this is the part of the, uh, the passage that I think we're a little more familiar with. Jesus says that the Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn it, but to save it. God's gift of Jesus Christ takes place not to punish the world, but to give us new and abundant life. So I think if you're not careful, right, when you do a simple, quick surface reading of this text, and I've heard many, many sermons say this kind of thing, it's really easy to land on a point like this. It's easy for us to say, okay, God comes not to judge us, but to save us, and so we don't have to do anything. Uh, the amount of people I've heard say that is, is, is crazy. And of course, 
There's, there's some truth there, right? It is true that this gift of Jesus is a free gift. It is gratuitous. It is undeserved. It is unmerited by us. But at the same time, at the same time, be careful because this does not mean that there is no such thing as condemnation, does it? I mean, the passage assumes that there is such thing as condemnation. It assumes that we are already condemned and that if we continue to disbelieve in the Son, we remain condemned. That's an important point, all right? While God's love is, of course, totally free, it must elicit some kind of response from us. The supreme act of God's love must change us. And coming towards the end of the passage, Jesus explains that you know, basically there are two types of people in this world. He tells us very bluntly that some people come gladly and happily and with joy into the light. And he says that some people hate the light. Some people come gladly into the light. Some people hate the light. Now again, hate here, don't think of hate here as some internal attitude, like you feel like you hate God. No, it's, that's not what it's talking about. So just because you don't have feelings of anger or hatred towards God doesn't mean that you're necessarily okay. Hate here simply means that there's too much distance between you and God. Hate here means that you're not really bothered about coming into the light. Uh, Shane was speaking last night at Praxis and we talked about the deadly sin of sloth and indifference and apathy. And I think this text is getting at the same point. All that stuff about God's love, which should just like make you so happy and it's, it's, it's incredible and life-giving and changes everything about your existence, you just feel like, eh, it's okay, I, whatever. You know, I'm indifferent towards it. I'm apathetic about it. Really believing in Jesus is very challenging. I'll tell you why. It's because he is the light. That's clear, right? And stepping into the light always reveals the truth about who you are. Stepping into the light means uncovering your deepest, darkest secrets. And stepping into the light means revealing your corrupted, sinful nature. Uh, for me, a sort of trivial analogy, you know, I think of walking out of a movie theater at two o'clock in the afternoon and suddenly the light just blinds you and hits you. And you notice, you know, your hair's maybe a little messed up from where you've been leaning. You've got popcorn crumbs all over you. Or maybe think of in the middle of the night, the light gets turned on and you're hardly clothed. You haven't got your makeup. It's you as natural as you're ever going to be. And let's face it, none of us want to be seen like that. Now, this is my last point, really. And there's something I find really, really interesting that didn't stand out for me until I've been really wrestling with this text. See, we'd expect the text to say that the more we reject God's light, the more sinful we become. Does that make sense? We expect it to say, the more we reject God's light, the more sinful we become. And there is some truth to that, of course. But listen to what Jesus actually says. He says, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light. Can you see how the logic is actually kind of the other way around? In other words, he says, the more that we sin, the more we end up rejecting the light. There's a subtle difference there. And it makes sense. Why? Because our sin stops us from wanting to draw close to God for fear that our deeds are going to be out in the open. Our sins are going to be exposed. So the more we have to hide, the more we seek darkness. The more we have to hide, the more we seek 
cover. And so we choose to stay in the movie theater. We choose to stay in our beds in the dark. And that, I think, is this vicious cycle of sin in our lives. It's the more bad things you do, the more that you feel bad about yourself, and the less you're inclined to go and seek healing and forgiveness. And then that, in turn, keeps you trapped in your sin. You know, I've spoken over the years to so many young people in church who tell me that they don't come to church and they don't pray. And I say, why? And they say, because I feel too bad. I feel too guilty to pray, too worthless to come to church. Or it's like people who tell me they're not ready for baptism because they're too bad, they're too sinful, which isn't that precisely the point of baptism? See, it's flipped, it's the other way around. No, Jesus is trying to say, being a sinner is exactly why you need the church. Being a sinner is precisely why you need God in your life. And so I don't know about you guys, but I, I want this church to be a place where people can be open. I want this church to be a place where people can be real and where people can be vulnerable. Precisely because we're sinners who need help. And if you're sitting here thinking, well, that's not me. It is. It's all of us, isn't it? No, Jesus offers healing for all of us, even though the process of stepping into the light can be revealing and it can be painful. But I think we're asked to just take the step and have the courage to, to stop hiding. And lastly, Jesus says, that those who have less to hide gladly come into the light. And the light exposes our sins and it helps us, helps us to become good and virtuous people. It's really ironic when you think about it because people fear coming into the light, afraid that the exposure of their deeds brings judgment and condemnation but it is right there in the light that they find their salvation and their life. In Ephesians, Paul says, God who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So friends, today I just want to encourage you all, no matter where you are in your life, don't hide. Right? Stop hiding. In this season of prayer, allow God to cleanse you, allow God to purify you, allow God to heal you. Yes, it can obviously be a very painful process, but that's what real love does. That's what God's love does. God loved us so much that he gave his only son so that we might have eternal life. So let Christ be your light. Have the courage to journey towards him and allow God to shape you into his image. Amen. If that is your desire, if that is what you want for your life today, I invite you to stand and let's sing our closing hymn together. Hymn number 79, O love of God, how strong and true. Hymn number 79. O Lord God, how strong and true.